Hello everyone, um, and thank you for that lovely introduction, Andrew. So, um, I am a group leader at the Kinghorn Cancer Center Garvin Institute, and my main interests are to develop uh, novel therapeutic approaches and more personalized treatment strategies for how we treat the disease. And so today I'll be telling you a little bit about how we're using cancer genome sequencing to develop new therapies for pancreatic cancer. So why do research on pancreatic cancer? Well, this is a disease with really dismal prognosis, very poor overall survival rates, um, with less than 5% five pa five of patients being alive five years post-diagnosis. One of the reasons is that this disease usually al already presents as advanced at the time of diagnosis, and um, the average survival for these patients is only about six months. Surgery is currently the only potential for cure for a very small proportion of patients who actually qualify, and there are currently no curative systemic therapies for this disease. So there's clearly a lot that needs to be done to improve outcomes for these patients. So why sequence cancer genomes? Well, firstly, as a scientist, um, we want to learn uh, what makes tumor cells different from the normal healthy cells in our body. And so just to illustrate further here, I don't really have a pointer, do I? Um, on the left, you can see the DNA codes in the normal healthy cells, as well as the cancer cells so, uh, shown here below. And it's these sort of variations in the DNA code of the cancer cells, so these are mutations, that we really want to identify in the, in the tumors, and then ultimately exploit these differences to both design better diagnostic tests to identify these patients, as well as to try to de design better therapies so that we can really tailor therapy according to each individual aberration that we find in these uh, tumors. So what do we know so far? So both our studies as well as those of others have now shown that cancer, and in particular pancreatic cancer, is a really varied disease. So it's very heterogeneous, and most of these genetic aberrations occur at a very low frequency. Um, so fairly rare, less than 5 or 2%. And so just to illustrate that further, you can see that in, in this pictorial, each of these lines indicates a potential different uh, genetic fingerprint, a potential tumor subtype. And so we think that this current um, one drug for all patients approach, which is the current standard of care therapy, um, standard, um, standardized therapy in pancreatic cancer, it just does not work. And so gemcitabine is the um, current standard of care and it's given to all patients. We know that there is a proportion of patients who respond really well, but a majority of the patients don't really benefit from, from this um, drug. So what can we do about this? So I want to show you a bit of uh, genomics, uh, hopefully genomics 101. Um, <laughs> so these are uh, circular plots. So this is where we have performed um, whole genome sequencing analysis. So this is where we uh, map out the DNA code, the whole DNA code in these uh, human uh, cancer samples, pancreatic cancer samples. And so here is just showing you 48, 48 of these. Each of these individual circles represents a summary of the genetic data for that particular patient. Now, if we look at one of these in more uh, detail, you can see that, um, so these are, these are just very broad summaries. We decided to, instead of looking at each uh, specific mutation, to kind of uh, take a step back and look at the whole picture. So the whole genetic picture for these, uh, for these specific uh, cancers. And so what you see here is chromosomes. And so we know that DNA, the human DNA is packed into chromosomes. And so each of these chromosomes, there are tiny little numbers shown here. Actually, I'll walk and show you. So moving in a circular manner, we've got chromosome one, two, three going down the line and X and Y at the top. So that's all of the genomic data summarized on this plot. So what do these individual um, lines really represent? So each line represents either a change in the individuals, um, the, the letters of the DNA code, so these are the mutations. It can also illustrate the chromosomes that, um, so if there are pieces missing in chromosomes, so these are deletions. It could be that chromosomes are present in too few or too many copies, and we also see these lines crossing from, for example, here you can see from chromosome 2, 
down to chromosome 12, which are also quite bad. So these are regions that of chromosomes that have apparently jointed together. Importantly, the take-home message is really that we were able to, based on this data, based on kind of stepping back and doing a whole sort of more, uh, more uh, syst systematic approach to the uh, analysis, we were able to classify about 10% um, of pancreatic cancers in this manner. So we've shown that 10% of pancreatic cancers carry this type of genetic uh, signature or genetic fingerprint. So what do we know about these tumors? And we've decided to call them unstable because these, these genomes are, are unstable because they have over 200 or more genetic aberrations. So what do we know about these tumors? So we know that they are fast growing, they're aggressive, and they don't seem to respond to gemcitabine. But there is evidence in other cancers, so this is now also where we draw we draw on the experience that's been already generated out there um, and published on other types of cancers, and breast cancer is one of the good examples, where it's, it's now uh, becoming increasingly known that cancers that, uh, breast cancers that have this type of signature do really well when you treat them with specific DNA, uh, very potent DNA damaging agents. Things like, they're quite old drugs, cisplatin, mitomycin C, but they are present in the clinic. So if we can demonstrate efficacy in pancreatic cancer, it will be much easier to transfer them over and to use them in the clinic. And just to show you that not every cancer looks like, not, not every pancreatic cancer looks like this. So here we have in contrast what we call a stable tumor genome. So you can see that there are very few lines here, so very few genetic aberrations. And this particular, so these types of tumors will then have a different response to various therapies. So it's all well and good. We have uh, classified, you know, we have divided up pancreatic cancer into different uh, tumor subtypes. But ultimately, we want to do something for the patients here. So how can we actually use this information to improve response in the clinic? And so this is our pipeline. This is what we want to do for as many uh, different types of drugs as possible in different um, molecular subtypes. So the idea is identify the genetic defect. And so we have done this. So here we have a tumor with an unstable genome, lots of different lines. In comparison, tumor with a stable genome. The next step is to create a hypothesis. And so for us, we predicted that these types of tumors should respond to the DNA damaging agent, mitomycin C. Unfortunately though, before you can convince an oncologist to actually give this therapy in the clinic, um, you have to show that it works in various preclinical models. So as part of our big project, we were also at the same time as um, our patient samples are getting sequenced, we would take a tumor piece and put it in the, so try to grow it in different laboratory conditions. So we would take these tumor pieces, grow them in mice. We have 90 different patient-derived, we call them xenografts. So these are patient-derived tumor mouse models that we use for testing of the most promising therapies. So this is the kind of second level before you advance into the clinic. Um, and we have also generated about 20 patient-derived cell lines. So this is the first step you want when you want to do your uh, initial drug screening of your most promising therapies. So I'll show you one of, our, um, so one of our early results for mitomycin C. So the idea is you plate your tumor cells in various types of dishes, you add your drugs of interest, and then you look at how these uh, tumors respond to different therapies. We always include gemcitabine because gemcitabine is the standard of care, so you really need to show that y your therapy of choice works better than the current standardized therapy. On the y-axis, you can see the percentage of cells alive following treatment. On the bottom, we have a tumor with an unstable genome on the left, and on the right, we, ha we are always comparing responses to um, other types of tumors because we want to demonstrate that this is specific to that uh, tumor subtype. Um, gemcitabine in blue and mitomycin C is shown in red. And so what's really interesting is that stable uh, tumor with a stable genome doesn't respond to either of the therapies. But excitingly and interestingly for us, the targeted therapy, and in this case mitomycin C, killed majority of the tumor cells in culture. So you can see that here, and specifically in the tumor with an unstable genome. So there was a whole lot of other data that we have subsequently generated, um, and now involving mouse models, 
uh, generated from these patient samples. But what I want to show you here is that in some cases, you can translate these things into the clinic. And so we have done this now for a handful of patients. So this particular patient had uh, <laughs> this genetic signature, had a tumor <laughs> with an unstable genome. Unfortunately, the patient progressed following uh, the initial <laughs> surgery and adjuvant gemcitabine therapy. So that's shown here on the CT scan. There is a dark shadow showing um, uh, recurrence here within this white circle. And we returned the information that was available to us, to the oncologist, to try to guide therapy for this patient. So with all the results that we had, the oncologist who was treating this patient was happy to, to put the patient on mitomycin C. And subsequently, um, this patient had a complete response. So again, in the circle, you can see the complete uh, loss of the, um, of the lesion. So complete disappearance of the lesion and um, had a complete response post-therapy. And so this patient is currently doing really well over three and a half years post-diagnosis, which is really good for pancreatic cancer. So are we closer to realizing personalized medicine for pancreatic cancer? Well, our early results certainly suggest that patients who received personalized therapy do better. So there is a, at least a near doubling in the survival for these patients. And just to illustrate our, so where we are currently at is we've got uh, three different <laughs> drugs now uh, as part of a clinical, um, so they're in clinical testing. <laughs> This is um, called the IMPACT trial. It's Individualized Medicine for Pancreatic Cancer trial. And it's testing some of the drugs that were the easiest for us to transfer over into the, into the clinic for specifically for pancreatic cancer. Probably the best example would be the HER2 um, subtype. And so this particular subtype is well known in breast cancer now. It's um, successfully being targeted with Herceptin. Um, specifically in HER2 amplified breast cancers. And so we're now trying to apply that to, pancre to, to um, tumors that carry HER2 amplification in pancreatic cancer. So it's all about repurposing agents for a different uh, specific cancer type. And so this is now uh, funded. Um, we also were, um, we have some promising uh, drugs that we're trying to uh, specifically target to, um, to so tailor them according to the genetic fingerprint of these tumors. And so we were fortunate enough that last year we did get and secured some government funding to, to work on some of these projects. So this includes the Cancer Australia, Cancer Council New South Wales, Cancer Institute New South Wales, and also the philanthropic, the generous philanthropic support, in, including um, Jane Hamstrich, um, the help of Ms. Jane Hamstrich um, with this. So again, just to illustrate here, the reason why gemcitabine is on there is that we know that there are respond, exceptional responders to gemcitabine. So what we're trying to do right now is to identify which, uh, what defines these patients, so how can we target them better? Because the reason why gemcitabine is given to pancreatic cancer patients is that these patients are quite, quite sick when they come into the clinic, and gemcitabine is actually one of the um, less toxic chemotherapies. So if you can identify the right patient for the right drug, in this case, gemcitabine, then this is one of the better therapies um, to go with. And so finally, I just want to show you that there is a whole bunch of new projects and um, potential tumor subtypes that are matched to novel and targeted therapies. And so for some of these, we have promising early results. And currently, they're largely on hold because you've got to get more, you always need more funding. So obviously a lot of these are part of our new grant applications, but we also heavily um, rely on philanthropic support. So really, hopefully what I've shown you here today is that the ultimate uh, goal for us really is to apply a more personalized approach to how we treat pancreatic cancer and really try to help as many patients as possible as they enter the clinic. So I would just like to um, acknowledge all of these people that are involved in the project. This is a large collaborative study, a multi-center study, um, also international uh, collaboration, all of our funding bodies, and also none of this work would be able, um, we would not be able to do without really the support of the patients, their family, friends, um, family members and friends, and also the members of the community. So thank you, and I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs>